We have a, uh, just a few announcements and reminders to begin our lecture, as always. Um, there's a homework that's due. I think uh, hopefully all of you must have seen the homework at least. If not, you have till Tuesday, next Tuesday, I think. Yeah. To, sorry? I think it's Wednesday. We are now. What do you mean? February 1st is Wednesday. February 1st is Wednesday? Is that yeah. how? Yeah. Okay, that was a mistake, but uh, I'll live with it. Um, okay, yeah. So uh, whatever, February, whatever is the date that Canvas says is the right answer. Um, if I made a mistake in you know setting the date, I'll live with it. Um, but uh, do start soon. Uh, some of you have already started and you might, you might have found yourself running into some sort of trouble and you can reach out to us, use uh, Canvas, um, come to office hours. Um, you, you know, the, the theory part of the homework is essentially like warm up for you to get started with the implementation so that it kind of gets you a sense of what your program should be doing. Um, another thing that uh, I think uh, might be worth noting is you can use the, the data that's given in the first part of the homework as a test case for your ID3 implementation. Whatever information gains you compute by hand should be the one that your program prints out. So it's a useful sort of a way to just make sure that everything works. But there's also this whole thing around cross-validation and getting the workflow going that might take some time. So please start mm -hmm. soon. Uh, you need to make sure that your code runs on the CAD machines as well. So I know that most of you um, might want to write your code in your laptop, but do make sure that it works on the machine where we actually run the code. Um, any questions about the homework? Any clarifications? Any difficulties? Yes. Um, which Oh, I see. So, yeah, the, no, I want you to kind of uh, print all the decisions that you make as as you go along in order to construct the tree. Yeah, yeah. There are only six features, right? So it should not be like a massive log file, but just you know, attach. Uh, it should print that uh, the details, and that way, you know, my TAs when they are grading, they can basically just uh, pick the right lines as the as they go along to see if it the output of your code matches what's in your report. And I say print something, that doesn't mean you should just have a bunch of print statements, you know, you should actually compute the right values. Um, you can't just say, you know, print entropy equals 0. 0.7. <laughs> uh, it needs to be the right numbers. <laughs> um, other questions, but does that, it, it sounds like a lot of logging, but uh, as you'll see that, uh, uh, in in production machine learning, we will end up relying a lot on uh, logging of intermediate states along the of the learning algorithm. I'll give you a reason why. Um, your code may take I don't know how long it takes to, the code that you write to run. Maybe it takes a few minutes. Maybe ten minutes stops. I know of instances where learning algorithms are churning away at massive data sets for months together. Now imagine that you have a program that's running for a few months and after three months, somebody trips on the power card. Or after three months, you find that there's a bug. You do want to keep track of all the intermediate states so that for two reasons. One, you want to recover from that in case there's a problem. And two, you in case there's a mistake, you do want to make sure that uh, you can trace where the problem is. We're not talking about programs that finish running in a matter of minutes but we're talking days, sometimes months. I know of one instance where a certain program was uh, uh, running at Google for like a period of six months or something. Um, it was a learning uh, thing. So the, the logging along the way is always good practice. It just so happens that it also helps us grade your uh, assignments. Any other questions? Yeah. So if we're using libraries like um, any do, do my TS want to answer that? Okay, so apparently they're already installed. Okay. Um, 
in case they are not in, you can you should check on the gate machines anyway right uh, and in case just to be safe you can add a requirement for text file uh, with the libraries and the right version yeah. and if that's there maybe uh, uh, if things don't work i'm sure uh, um, I, that one extra line would not hurt anyone other questions but do not uh, start installing things that are not there. It will be, I don't uh, want, yeah? Yeah, I just have a virtual environment on my machine with all the stuff that I need to have a right now. Yeah, I would suggest you make sure they're all available on Kate. Spend like maybe 15 minutes on Kate just to see what's there and what's not. Because this will also help for future homeworks. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Google Colab allows you to do the experiments nicely and you don't have to worry about running it. There are a few issues with Google Colab. The primary one being, it's going to be a shared document that you can edit even after you submit. And I'm not fond of that. Um, if you do use Google Colab, I recommend you uh, export the code into a Python file and the document separately. Give us snapshots of both of those. Also save it as an IPython notebook and tell us how to run the whole thing. Um, I, I, I will not accept a URL to a Google Colab as a submission because I don't know when you stop editing it. So is that a, a reasonable thing? Would you be able to run things on a Jupyter notebook? Probably. They don't look happy. So let's make sure that, uh, uh, let's make sure that you have a Python file uh, that you export. Other questions? Um, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, in, the, uh, in the first part of the class is about projects. Uh, just a reminder that you have a class project where uh, I'll be giving you a data set and you'll be building learning algorithms uh, on the data set. And uh, you know, so the, the way it will work is I'll construct a training set and a validation set for you. You will be running a bunch of learning algorithms on them uh, and you know, making predictions on the validation set. In addition, I'll also have a test set where I will not show you the labels, or I'll actually have just dummy labels for each example. You need to read the test set and uh, you'll have to uh, upload the results of, of your algorithm's predictions to Kaggle, where Kaggle knows, will know the true labels and you'll, your accuracy or whatever metric will be decided by Kaggle and your submission will be put on a leaderboard. Uh, some of you may have already participated in these sorts of Kaggle challenges. Some of you may have not. It's kind of fun. Um, I haven't yet decided, I haven't yet nailed down the data set that you'll be using. So there'll be a little bit of changes, uh, a little bit of updates to the milestones for the project. The first milestone was originally supposed to be early February. It will be moved a little bit. Uh, it's not too much work. All I need to make sure is that You've registered for Kaggle, you've downloaded the data set, and you can open the file. It's not a lot of work, but uh, for that to happen, I need to give you a file. Um, so the, the deadlines will be updated uh, a little bit. Uh, I'll post a message on Canvas once I decide the date. I'll also announce in the next lecture. All right, yes. No, there isn't. No, it makes grading so painful. Uh, and frankly speaking, it becomes hard to assign grades for projects because uh, everyone does want a different thing. In a large class, in a smaller class, it's fine, but in a large class, it, uh, everyone doing their own thing makes life a little bit hard for me at the end of the semester. And it does not change your learning outcome anyway, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, Let's resume uh, our discussion of linear models. In the last lecture, we looked at, uh, we started looking at uh, this class of functions called linear functions, linear classifiers or linear regressors. And uh, the, the, uh, in the, the first thing that we saw was this sort of an intuitive explanation for why linear classifiers or linear regressors might be a good class of functions to consider. And the intuition that I was trying to convey was uh, they, they have a, they are simple functions and uh, that tends to generalize better. 
One lesson for the entire semester that I'll keep repeating over and over again is in the absence of any other information, prefer simpler hypotheses. Linear classifiers are simple functions. And then we, the last thing that we saw was uh, this discussion about the geometry of linear classifiers. And that's where I want to pick up the lecture today. A linear classifier, just to remind you, is nothing more than a function of, uh, so uh, I have some inputs, x, I'm calling, uh, as always, we'll call the input to the learning problem x. And x is a vector that is, uh, let's say, d-dimensional. It means it's a collection of numbers. I'm going to call that x1, x2, xd. If you have trouble imagining d-dimensional vectors, think of them as an array with d elements, an array of numbers with d elements. Our goal is to decide whether any x belongs to a plus one or a minus one, a binary classification problem. And the way a linear classifier is defined is um, it predicts plus one if I'm going to write the whole thing and then kind of compress the notation a bit. W1, x1 plus W2, x2 plus Wn, xn plus B, a number, is more than, uh, is positive. So what we have here are a collection of N parameters and a bias. So together, these are all called the parameters, all the blue stuff. And uh, these sometimes are called weights. And this thing here is called the bias or the bias term. And so the, the, the definition of a linear classifier is that it's an expression that uh, predicts a plus one if every uh, feature xi when multiplied by the weight, corresponding weight, wi, and then add it up, so you get w1x1 plus w2x2 all the way to wnxn plus a single number b bias if that whole sum is positive. Here b is a number and w1 to wn together, I'll call that w, is a vector. And that's a, there are n elements here, so this is an n-dimensional vector. Um, of course, uh, rather than writing it in this sort of a cumbersome way, I can just say b plus the dot product between w and x, or I could say w transpose x. The convention that I normally use is I don't like to write vectors as row vectors, but as column vectors. So you have x1, x2, xn, and then this is really not written this way, but w1, wn. So w transpose x is simply the dot product between this vector and this vector, which gives you a single number. I add a bias, still have a number. If that number is positive, then I predict zero. Otherwise, I predict, sorry, if that number is positive, I predict a plus one. Otherwise, I predict a minus one. This is about as boring a definition of the classifier that uh, as I could make it. Literally, there's no more, uh, nothing else to hide, not, nothing hidden here. It's just a function that predicts a plus one or a minus one by taking the dot product of the features and the inputs, adding a bias and taking the sign of that. Question. Um, what was the bias term again? So the bias term is just the name given to this B. It's a constant. It's a, it's, it's a, another parameter that's going to be learned. It's a single number. Okay. Yes. So the things that are going to be learned are these two things. Uh, I, I never put arrows on top of the vectors, but W is a vector. So B and W are the parameters of a linear classifier that need to be learned from data. So any questions about just the definition of a linear classifier? In general, whenever you encounter a new uh, model, a new type of a classifier, like a linear classifier or a decision tree, or maybe a multi-layer neural network that we'll see later, you have to ask a few, you essentially ask the same questions over and over again. The first question that I like to ask is, how does it work? How does it make predictions? 
So in this case, in a decision tree, the way it makes predictions is you go down the tree and take the path to the leaf. And the leaf is the prediction. In the linear classifier, the prediction is what I just described here. Another question that you need to ask is, now that I know how to make predictions, how do you learn it from data? So there's, I want you to kind of mentally separate this idea of prediction and learning because prediction is using the learned classifier. Learning is producing the, the classifier itself from data. Questions, questions about the mechanic, the, just the definition of a linear classifier. Sometimes this is also called a linear threshold unit, LTU, because you know you have a linear expression and then you threshold it at zero. So the nice thing about a yes. Yeah, so uh, W is R and X is an R D. Uh, did I say R D? Okay, that's a mistake. Uh, everything's an R D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a good catch. Some I usually use. Uh, okay, let's make everything n because I have n everywhere. Everything is R n because I have n numbers here, n numbers here. These are all n's. Yeah, you have n numbers or d numbers, some fixed set of numbers. Okay. Now the nice thing about linear classifiers is that they have an intuitive geometric interpretation. You might recognize that in two dimensions. The linear classifier is nothing more than um, it's defined by a certain line. So you have some examples that are positive, you have some examples that are negative, and the linear classifier literally just bisects the region between them and declares that one side of this space is positive and the other side is negative. Now, when a new point comes here, you just check which side of this line it lies on. I'm talking still in two dimensions, which side of the line it lies on, and uh, in this case, this point here is in the positive side, so it gets a label plus. This gets a label minus. And uh, so the, the line in question here is when w1x1 plus w2x2 plus b is equal to zero. On this side, on the positive side, the sum is going to be greater than zero. On the negative side, the sum is going to be less than zero. The convention that I tend to use while drawing these pictures is I put an arrow. Uh, pointing to the positive side. And it's just, it's not just an arrow, it's actually the normal vector to that line. And the normal is defined by the, the weights W1 and W2. And this is in two dimensions. And hopefully you've all seen this uh, maybe in middle school or something. And in three dimensions, the, uh, the same object in three dimensions is not a line, but a plane. So we have this uh, three-dimensional space like this room and a plane imagine that a plane slices the room into two parts extending all the way to infinity and one side of this space is going to be positive the other side is going to be negative in four dimensions or five or six or in d dimensions the object becomes not a plane but a hyperplane so i'll generally talk about a linear classifier being defined by a certain hyperplane the hyperplane in question is the boundary between the positive and the negative side. And the equation of that hyperplane is simply where this value becomes zero. Or in d dimension, like using the what I wrote before, in d dimension, the hyper the equation of the hyperplane is when this value becomes zero or when this value is equal to zero. So w transpose x plus b equals zero is a hyperplane in d dimension. Questions, questions about uh, the geometry of a linear classifier. Now you might ask, what's the point of this? Why do I need to know the geometry of the linear classifier? It leads to a better intuition and thinking about planes in high dimensions allows us to use intuitions that we may have built up in uh, whenever we encountered lines and planes in such geometrical objects and use them for designing or understanding more importantly, the properties of algorithms that produce these objects. Any questions, any thoughts? This is roughly where we stopped at the end of the last lecture, yes.
uh, literal definition that's kind of geometrical interpretation of the normal factor. Is there a geometric interpretation of the bias? There is actually, and we'll talk about that um, in a little while. There is a neat interpretation of the germ of the bias. The short answer is in two dimensions. It not the B itself is a scaled version of the bias is the intercept of the line. So you have a line and it, uh, so this thing here is a, it depends on the B. If you change B in particular, if B equals zero, you get a line that goes through the origin. And uh, you know, you change B, it basically keeps the line. You get a set of these parallel lines for different values of B. So B changes where the line is with respect to the origin, how far it is from the origin. And W decides what's the, uh, the you know, it, it basically rotates the line. In D dimensions, D, B decides how far the hyperplane is from the origin and the Ws together talk about the, the normal direction of the line with respect to the line. Yes. Um, that could be a goal. In fact, um, the support vector machine is an algorithm that actually explicitly tries to uh, do that, but not necessarily. You may have other reasons to put this li the line um, that is being learned very, very close to the positive. Why? Because maybe you have some reason to be kind of force a big gap to the negative. I'll give you an example. Uh, let's, I'll give you an example of, uh, uh, so imagine that the positive class corresponds to um, say, um, so, so let's say the classification task is, I need to look at a chest X-ray and decide whether there is some awful condition. And you'd rather make a mistake on one side than the other. You'd rather err on the side of predicting, um, you, know, you don't want to miss some, you don't want to miss uh, um, some uh, whatever shows up in X-rays. So, sorry? Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not a doctor, what do I know? <laughs> um, so, you want to kind of give yourself this sort of a big margin of safety. From the, uh, so that even if a point lies maybe here, you still predict it as positive so that someone else can take a look. Imagine a self-driving car that has to decide whether to go straight or turn left. You want to make sure that uh, the person detector has a big margin of safety um, so that you know you don't hit people. Um, so you there could be other reasons to not put the line right in the middle. And there's a, there's a more sort of a interesting technical reason for that that argument does not work, which is that sometimes the data might not actually separate the pluses and the minuses so neatly. So there's no middle to speak of. Yes. Uh, we're jumping a few lectures ahead. We'll talk about that quite a bit. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about something that is much less interesting than geometry, which is about notation. Uh, this is uh, a little, th I promise you, this is going to be a little tedious. But trust me, it's good for you. It's for your good. I told you I'm not a doctor, but I can say those lines. <laughs> so I said the prediction function is W transpose X plus B. And the sign of that, this is the sign function. Uh, you know, the sign, it's a plus one or a minus one. So the problem is this, we, we may end up forgetting, put, you know, just remembering this bias term all the time. You might just accidentally, imagine you're writing your code and you have to write W transpose X plus B, W transpose X plus B, and you might forget to add the B. There's a neat trick for you to kind of carry around the bias term without actually having to explicitly write it. And the way to do that is to note that um, I, I'm going to write the whole thing and then show you the neater version. So this expression here is really that W1, W2, you have N dimensional vector. I take the transpose of this with X1, X2, and I take the dot product. So this gives me a number plus B. Now, instead of doing that, so that's exactly this. 
So instead of doing that, what I could do, let's keep this. Let's examine this quantity here. So I have, I have I, W I, X I plus B. I can rewrite this as W I, X I plus this whole thing plus B times one, just the number one, right? Remember the W's and the B are all learned together. So, and the X is part of the input. Well, I can add one more input, which is always a constant, the number one. So what I could do is instead of writing W1, uh, you know, so the way, I, the, what I mean is, this is W1 X1 plus two X2 plus B times one. So really we have all these weights here. Uh, let me zoom in so that you don't have to stare at the smallest part of the screen. So you have all these weights, the Ws, and a bias. All of these things are learned. And the other thing that it's multiplied with are all known to us when we have an input. So I can group them together separately. So instead of writing it this way, I could write the vector um, B. I can just put a B at the beginning, W1, W2, Wn, transpose. I always have a number one x1, x2, xn. And there's no more extra b to take care of because I've essentially folded in the bias into the weight vector. Any thoughts about this? Any questions about this? I'm going to revisit this using cleaner, uh, more better typeset version of this. But uh, this is what I'm, th this is a gist of what I'm going to talk about, but with something that is written without my handwriting. So, I can rewrite the input x. I can consider the, I can just add an extra feature. That extra feature always takes the value one. Doesn't matter what the input is, that extra feature is a constant. I'm going to call this augmented version x prime. At the end of this list of n entries that form the w, I'm going to add this bias term. So this thing here is. And has n plus one element, just like this one here. And I'm going to call this W prime. So I want you to note that W transpose X plus B is identical to W prime transpose X prime. It's mathematically the same thing. But the nice thing is uh, I don't have to remember to write down a B here. So I can always add an extra constant feature and go to an n plus one dimensional space where we don't need to carry around the bias term. I haven't talked about why the bias term is important, uh, but this is a, a notational trick. I'll come to you in a minute. The prediction right now is not the sign of W transpose X, but it's the same as uh, it's equivalently the sign of W prime transpose X prime. These, because these two things are identical. What we have done here is we've increased the dimensionality from, if we had N features before, we've got N plus one features now, but that one extra feature we are adding is a trivial feature. Its value is always one. And the, the benefit of this sort of notational uh, hack is that this term that I call B that you might forget to write in your code is going to be there. So when you're implementing these things, when you're reading the data, you can just, as you read your data, just add that one extra feature, dummy feature that's always one. And then you don't have to worry about the carrying around the bias term. Um, in this increased dimensional space, because the bias term is zero, and this was related to the discussion earlier, if the bias term is zero, the line goes through the origin. So in this higher n plus one dimensional space, we have this hyperplane that is going through the origin, when earlier we, we allowed the hyperplane to go anywhere in the space. Uh, the reason I'm presenting this is because for all the discussion from now on, I'm not going to write W transpose X plus B. Instead, I'll just write W transpose X with the understanding that that X has this constant feature somehow wrapped inside it. And the W that we are working with is the uh, feature that is the, the way it is operating in the N plus one dimensional space. There's a question. Yeah, so the dimension for the one would be the end of the 
it doesn't really matter, right? We're just adding these numbers up. Um, in fact, so this is a convention that I use. This is a convention that I have seen a few others use, but I've also seen the exact opposite convention taken by some other writers where they make it a point to carry around the bias. Uh, personally, I find that to be a little tedious because I, I know at some point I'll forget it. Um, so I'd rather take care of it in the features when I'm reading the data, but some others want to write it to make sure to remind whoever is reading it to know that there is a bias term. Whether you write down the bias term explicitly or implicitly through this feature that I'm going to call the bias feature, remember that it's always there. Not having it is a bad idea. Um, always add a bias term to your linear classifiers because that just increases the expressiveness uh, in a very technical way. Other questions? Notice, by the way, I have done nothing new here. I have just rewritten the same thing that we started off with using a slightly different notation, using, you know, using some assumptions. And I'm just telling you that this assumption is going to be in place for the rest of the semester. And hopefully this assumption is also going to be in place in your code, because otherwise there's a good chance your model will not do as well as uh, having the bias term. Questions. So let me give you a preview of coming attractions. Now that you all know what linear classifiers are. All I have told you is what linear classifiers are. I have not told you how to learn them. Turns out that linear classifiers are like extremely well studied in machine learning. There are many, many named algorithms that uh, are just algorithms for learning a linear classifier. One of the first one of those that uh, one of those that we'll encounter and will be a good part of your next homework is the really old perceptron algorithm, which learns a linear classifier uh, by allowing the program to make mistakes and then correcting from the mistakes in uh, using what's called the perceptron update. Rule. The support vector machine learns a linear classifier by defining a certain cost function and optimizing it. Logistic regression learns a linear classifier, but from a probabilistic perspective. The naive base classifier with certain assumptions, it turns out is also a linear classifier. In more uh, recent uh, uh, neural network universe, sometimes a linear classifier is also called a one layer neural network. And you can learn it using the same sort of mechanisms that we use for learning other models, which it turns out is basically one of these, uh, one of these things. So, the linear classifier is like your bread and butter. The first thing that you'll try, because if it works, you're done. If it does not, you still have some useful baseline to build on top of. These are different learning algorithms for linear classifier, but in all cases, no matter how you learn it, at the end, the prediction is basically the same thing. You have a collection of weights and a bias, but uh, of course, you're not going to carry around the bias term. You take, given a new example, you take the dot product of the parameters with your features. If that value is more than zero, you predict plus one. If that value is less than zero, you predict minus one. Doesn't matter how you got the weights, which algorithm gave you the weights, which learning algorithm gave you the weights, you're going to make the prediction the same way. Any questions about any of these things? I haven't told you about it, what any of these algorithms are. At this point, this is just a bunch of words on a slide. At the end of the semester, hopefully, all of you are experts on everything. In fact, at the end of the semester, you might have implemented most of these for your homeworks. If there are no questions, I want to kind of uh, move topics into uh, a discussion about the expressiveness of linear classifiers. What so far I've told you what linear classifiers are, but not about what kinds of functions they can characterize. So that's the that's going to be the business for today's uh, for this lecture. What functions do linear classifiers express? And I'll tell you that I, I'm going to point out that linear classifiers can characterize many interesting functions, but not everything. And even if your more if your data is not uh, if your 
the data that you have, the concept that you have cannot be characterized by a linear classifier. There are certain tricks you can do to make the, uh, you know, make a linear classifier work. So let's start off by asking what Boolean functions linear classifiers express. Many, many Boolean functions are linearly separable. Linearly separable just is another way of saying there exists a hyperplane that can make the same predictions as that function. There exists a hyperplane that is consistent with the data. So many Boolean functions are linearly separable, but not everything. Uh, in contrast, the other model that you encountered before, decision trees, can represent every single Boolean function. So linear classifiers represent a strict subset of the functions that decision trees can represent. And this is something that's worth keeping in mind. Let's see uh, a few examples to kind of get a sense of how this works. Imagine that we have this conjunction, a function that is uh, 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 y, that I'm calling y, that takes the value, that takes the value true if um, x1 is true and x2 is true and x3 is true. I can write this equivalently as a truth table with uh, eight rows. It has the value one only when x1 and x2 and x3 are all one. If even one of those are zero, like here, the output zero. Okay. This is, uh, hopefully you've seen this enough number of times that this should not be any surprise key. Now I'm going to define a linear classifier that agrees with this definition every single time. So consider this function here, x1 plus x2 plus x3 minus three. And I've just enumerated the values that the function takes here. And this function is negative for every row except the last one. So it's value. So the, remember this linear classifier is W transpose X plus B is greater than or equal to zero. So importantly, there is this equality here. Whenever this X1 plus X2 plus X3 is greater than or equal to zero, your linear classifier predicts true or plus one. And I'm now kind of abusing notation by merging minus ones and zeros here. Hopefully that's not too confusing. And otherwise it predicts zero if the value is negative. And notice that whenever the conjunction is negative, conjunction is false, your linear classifier also predicts false. So what that means is your conjunction is equivalent to a linear classifier, x1 plus x2 plus x3 greater than or equal to zero. In this case, if I want to map this notation to this notation, I have x1 plus x2 plus x3 minus three is greater than or equal to zero. So my weights here are just ones. So I have a W which is one, one, one. The bias is minus three. Or the, the folded notation that I just described would be something like uh, one, 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 and minus three. Questions about this simple example here. This is there to just convince you that uh, a conjunction, a monotone, con this is called a monotone conjunction, this kind of a function. It's called a monotone conjunction where the output is true whenever the, uh, the, combin the conjunction of its inputs are true, but there is no negation allowed. There is no not in, in the not operator does not show up here. Now, suppose negations show up. Turns out that's also okay. The easy trick, it's almost like a heuristic that you can use. Whenever you see a negation, just throw in a one minus X. So you have X1 and X2 and X3 and, and not X3. This, um, I don't know if uh, this notation is common outside of computer science. So let me just, outside of, you know, uh, wherever you encounter discrete math, this is and, and this is not. So you have X1 and X2 and not X3. The heuristic is whenever I see a negation, I just replace that variable with one minus that variable. So X1 plus X2, X1 and X2 and X3 was just add those things up and you subtract three. Here we have X1 plus X2, I'm adding them up. Instead of X3, I just have one minus X3, should be greater than or equal to three. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to convince yourself that 
these two things, this and this, correspond to the same function. A trivial way of checking for that is to uh, just write down the truth table. You only have eight things to write. Yes, there's a question. There's a question on Zoom. If linear classifiers are a strict subset of decision trees, why not just use decision trees? Does it give a better accuracy or does it generalize better? That's a good question. So this goes back to the point of restricting the hypothesis space. Decision trees explore every possible function out there, which means if your function is a really complicated function, you're not going to find it with a linear classifier. On the other hand, if your data have noise in it, your decision tree will fit the noise. So restricting the hypothesis space allows you to generalize better because it by design does not allow your model to fit the noise. The, the, sometimes you hear the phrase, the word capacity. Your classifier or your model does not have the capacity to fit the noise. And when I say capacity, I mean this in a very, uh, uh, there is a technical definition of this that we'll encounter later on, but it cannot uh, express complicated functions and noise tends to be, uh, tends to be complicated. So linear classifiers tend, can generalize better than decision trees. But of course, it's not a certainty. Now imagine that your true function, the concept that you're learning is itself a complicated function. Then you don't have a choice but to use a more complicated model, a more complicated hypothesis space. So at that point, you might ask, so what do I do? What kind of a model should I use? And that's where it becomes a bit of a design thing. You need to play with the data, get a sense of what works, and uh, and slash or use any domain knowledge that you may have. But that's a good question. Yes, there's a question in the back. I can't hear you, sorry. Why are we so the question is, why are we doing this examples with Boolean functions when, uh, even though, yeah, of course it's fascinating and you can do this for a lifetime, but why are we doing this? The answer is, these kinds of functions are almost like little toys that allow us to understand in a very clean way what can and cannot be expressed. And these little functions also give us some intuitions about how to reason about this class of functions, uh, about this concept class, or uh, about this hypothesis space. There's a third reason. Uh, they make for nice examples on a slide. So there's also that. Another class of function, yes. Yes, that's right. Was there a question? Or... Okay, okay. So yes, uh, the, you are expressing a weighted sum of the features and checking if that weighted sum is more than some threshold. Okay, uh, it turns out that uh, if your and were replaced with ors, you can still design a linear threshold unit. Not going to do that because uh, there are already questions about why am I doing this? So if I start talking about the junctions, then uh, you might just walk out. But uh, yeah, at this point you might say, um, you know, uh, so what? What are, okay, this discussion is not useful if I don't show you an example of a function that is not linearly subject. There is a famous function, a Boolean function. I say famous, not you know, out in the real world, but in the machine learning universe. Uh, there's a famous function which is not linearly subject, which is the XOR function, which is the parity function. It looks like this. If you have two features, X1 and X2, I have. Why am I writing in this sort of a? And X1, XR, X2 looks like if both inputs are zero, then the output zero. If any one of them is a one, then the outputs are one. If both inputs are one, then the output is zero. This function, it turns out, is not linearly separable. 
And the way to kind of see that is to plot this function. It looks like this. You get a zero here. No. Oh no, what have I done? You get a zero here. No, you get a one here. Zero, zero, one, one. So the, you get this crossing thing. You have a one on one, two ones and uh, two zeros that are uh, across. A better picture for that is something like uh, this drawing here. Imagine that you have a data set like this, where uh, the pluses are in the first and the third quadrants, the minuses are in the second and the fourth quadrant. If you want to kind of keep someone busy for a while and not bother you, ask them to try to draw a line, a straight line that separates the pluses and the minuses, because it's not possible. So this um, is an example of a linear of a data set that is not linearly separable. And I say the XOR function is a pop is a famous uh, uh, function in machine learning because in in the history historically one of the first algorithms to train a, to kind of build a linear classifier was the perceptron algorithm in the in the nineteen late fifties and there was a massive hype around it. You should have seen the articles. I'll probably show you some news articles from uh, the nineteen uh, around nineteen fifty nine. It could have been written about chat GPT in 2023. Like this incredible hype. This is the future. And then Marvin Minsky and uh, Seymour Papert wrote a book called Perceptron, where they pointed out that's nice, but your perceptron cannot even represent the XOR function. Story, the story goes that because of that book, funding on AI was pulled, and that led to the first AI winter. Uh, where AI research essentially just kind of shrunk. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, the XOR function does not uh, features often as a counter example for what kinds of functions cannot be linearly separable. There's a question at the back. Is it possible to define some type of uh, function here that uses like starting of the type of So you've got like multiple linear classifiers um, so you, that separate the so you want to do something like maybe these two lines and everything inside is positive. Yeah, you could. And uh, that, in fact, there is a way of doing that. There's a more uh, uh, general, general version of that, which I'll discuss almost immediately now. In fact, that's literally the next thing that I'm going to talk about, but not using the notation of defining a convex polytope. Instead, rather than changing the function, rather than changing the function to be a more complicated function, I, mean, I want to change the one thing that we have in control when we are reading the data, which is we can change the features so that you can express more complicated things. So, but before that, uh, I just want to point out that XR is not linearly separable. Uh, this is also the parity function uh, for two dimensions, but uh, in three dimensions, the parity function might be something like f of x is one, when the number of ones is even. So distinguishing even and odd uh, number of uh, bits is not a linearly separable concept. Many non-trivial Boolean functions are not linearly separable. So this is where uh, we have to kind of think about, do we, are we stuck? If the true concept is a non-trivial Boolean function of this kind, then it's not linearly separable. So what can we do? Turns out even these functions can be made linear in the way that uh, was kind of hinted at before. Here's a sort of a toy example. I have a data set which is uh, which consists of one dimensional features. One dimensional vectors is just a rather uh, a fancy way of saying real numbers. So I have a data set where every feature is a real number. And I have circles and pluses here. And these points are not separated, cannot be separated by a one dimensional line. I claim these points cannot be separated by a one dimensional line. What is a one dimensional line? Just a point. Just a point. A one dimensional line is just a point. So a two dimensional line is a line, a three dimensional line is a plane. A one dimensional line is just a point. You cannot put a point anywhere in between these things that says everything on one side is plus and everything on the other side is a zero. If you put it here, 
you get all of these wrong. You put it here and you say this way, you get all of these wrong. This data set is not linearly separable using by just putting a point anywhere. Now, I want to kind of uh, leave it as an exercise for you to think about this offline, about why a one-dimensional line is a point, and it fits this definition of a linear threshold unit that we had before. It's kind of just worth wrapping your head around that. But I can make this into a linearly separable concept by transforming the features. So if every feature here is the number, any one of these is the number X, it's, it's a single number, right? Because it's just a single, uh, a single uh, uh, dimensional vector. I can change the representation from this uh, one feature with X to having two features. I'm going to create this feature vector consisting of X and X square. So what I mean by that is I take these points and I introduce an additional dimension, which is completely dependent on the original data. But then, for example, for this point, uh, if the original point here was a two, I create a new feature vector, a new point called minus two comma four. Similarly, this one, if this was a two, this also becomes, if this was a two, this becomes two comma four. Notice that the, what sometimes I call this, uh, the blown up feature space. The blown up feature vectors are deterministic functions of the original features, right? I mean, give, if you give me any point anywhere on this line, I can tell you what the corresponding uh, blown up thing would be because it's defined using this pair x comma x square. But the cool thing here is to note that in this higher dimensional space where I have one extra dimension, I can draw a line that separates out the pluses and the zeros. So in this expanded feature space, the data is linearly separable. This is a neat trick. This is essentially saying by considering feature transformation where it, the points are kind of deterministically transformed to allow for polynomials, for example, second degree polynomials, I can convert my data that was not originally linearly, trans, uh, linearly separable to being linearly separable. Any questions or thoughts about this? If you've never seen this before, this may seem like magic. It's not, I mean, it's like kind of very boring stuff, but it, it's kind of easy at this level, but to kind of force you to think about this a little bit more, I want you to construct a feature transformation that takes your XOR function that you had, that I showed you before, and converts it into a linearly separable version, possibly with additional dimensions. This is a, uh, it's like a neat exercise because you, it forces you to think about how this works. Any questions, any uh, thoughts about this idea of transforming the input space to kind of force linear separability? Yeah. How do you know? So, okay, so I'll, let me kind of ask the question that you are asking, but more with uh, a slightly different way. My suggestion was if your data was not linearly separable, you can always transform the space so that you get a linearly separable data set. Well, that's nice, but how do you know what the transformation is? How did you know that in this case, the right answer is to use X square? Maybe. I could have done, or maybe one could have invented a different feature transformation, which consists of features X, the number itself, and then the tangent of X, and then, I don't know, the, that's X cube. I've now got a three dimensional vector um, with these things. And how do you know this is not the right answer? If you think that's not the right answer, maybe I, the right answer is the log of absolute value of tan of X square. I can keep making this crazy. How do you know what's the right feature transformation? Answer, there is no free lunch. You think hard about the problem, see what works, and uh, you know, use some domain knowledge sometimes. The usual, uh, uh, you use cross-validation, 
basically any time we talk about representing data and learning uh, or or uh, designing features one way or another the answer comes back to the same thing and uh, you can't just randomly try out things one systematic way of doing this could be using cross validation to essentially do well designed to design your experiments to verify whether this is a good uh, choice or not so you you consider the original features and the cross validated uh, and the transformed features perform cross validation on both see which one is better yes this this sort of thing like you're talking about for our disposal and algorithms for the features is this, this sort of thing that's yeah so that's right so what i described here is a feature transformation that is deterministic that is the hand design alternatively we could convert the problem of discovering these transformations as a into a learning problem and that is a certain lens for looking at multi layer neural networks everything except the topmost layer is essentially learning feature transformations for the topmost layer that is a neural network now we've not covered multi layer neural networks so maybe those words mean, mean nothing but that's the the that's the you're right other questions yes actually there's something mathematical way to find out some features that we Ah, so so essentially the question was, given a data set, right? I'm assuming it's given a data set. Given a data set, can you mathematically show that it is linearly separable? Right. Answer is yes. You can write a linear program. Uh, if you're familiar with linear programs, you can think about it. That ex exactly that has a sol that has a solution if and only if the data is linearly separable. Another way of uh, doing that is to train a linear classifier that comes with some, uh, use a learning algorithm that comes with certain guarantees of finding a linear separator if it exists. If it succeeds, you're done. And uh, one such le learning algorithm is the perceptron. Other questions? I feel like I've been having a discussion with this row a lot, and I completely ignore the far row, mostly because the microphone is here. Are there questions from that row? No questions or given up? <laughs> okay. So, um, there is also this, uh, I'll, there, there's a question on Zoom. Um, we can also blow up the features to something like, is X greater than two? or is x less than five yes you can design these more complicated features uh using other heuristics like what you use for decision trees where you discretize things but i would suggest uh polynomials tend to work better because uh if you are familiar with polynomial interpolation basically this is a, a version of in, the regression version of this would be higher or higher degree polynomial interpolation so what the, the question was can i have features of the form given a certain x let's say this is uh, two and this value is minus one so i can have a feature that says uh, given an input x i convert it to is x greater than equal to two is x less than equal to minus one so for this point the feature value would be one zero for any point here, the features would be 0, 0. And for any point here, the feature is 0, 1. And these points are going to be linearly separable. So that's going to work. But then you have to invent it. So this is another feature transformation that also works for this case. So we're still talking about why linear classifiers are interesting. So my argument was many interesting functions like uh, Conjunctions, disjunctions with negations and such things are linearly separable, but not all of them are linearly separable. Classic example is the XOR function. But even if your data is not linearly separable, you can convert it into a linearly separable form using these feature transformations. And then there is almost linearly separable data. Like look at this example here. You can't draw a line that perfectly separates the pluses and the minuses. I think someone mentioned something like this before. And uh, yeah, you can try to fit a line anywhere and it's not going to separate the pluses and the minuses, but maybe this one comes close. You 
you have almost separable data and there are some points that are on the wrong side and then the question is how much error do you allow so you can say that you know i'm willing to give up like you know one percent of accuracy in exchange for a, a set of classic models that are easy to train come with guarantees and uh, might generalize better because they are simpler so there are a lot of data sets are almost linearly separable and this tends to happen more often if the number of features you have becomes higher and higher uh, in the limit if you have an infinite number of features which means that you are operating in what's called the infinite dimensional space if you want to if you want your head, head to hurt try to visualize that so if you are operating in an infinite dimensional space then basically any data set is linearly separable so uh, usually as the number of features increases data sets become more and more linearly separable so the question for you to think uh, the, any question from uh, anyone about data sets of this kind just to quickly summarize this part um, many functions are linearly separable as a result it's often a good guess for a hypothesis space not all functions are linearly separable um, xor and non-trivial boolean functions are examples of that parity is another example of that but there are ways of making them linearly separable by messing around with the feature space and blowing up the feature space to using feature transformation. Now, the, the next thing I want to discuss with, the, with respect to the expressiveness of linear classifiers is a question that came up before. Why do we need this bias term at all? Why do we need that constant, a number that we need to add to the weighted sum of the features? And the answer is, imagine that the bias term was not there. Then your weight vector, this line here, if B was equal to zero, will go through the origin. Now that limits the expressiveness of the linear classifier. It limits what kinds of functions can be uh, captured. For example, this data set here is linearly separable. I can draw a line that separates the pluses and the minuses, but I cannot draw a line that goes through the origin that separates the pluses and the minuses. This is why we need a bias term because we don't know where the data is located in the high dimensional space. It could be located like this kind of inconveniently so that the line has to go uh, off center. So this was the answer to your question from before. If B is zero, then we are restricting the learning algorithm that is exploring this classified hypothesis space to produce hyperplanes that go through the origin and nothing else. And this may not be expressive enough. Now, the thing is, uh, I say this, and this seems like, you know, this, this picture might hopefully seem like an obvious uh, case, but it's very easy to forget this. I know of uh, at least one instance where someone was trying to replicate a research paper, and they just could not get the numbers that were published. It was like off by quite a bit. And this was a well-respected research group, so it's weird to see that their papers are the, the results are not working and it turns out that in their code they forgot to add the bias term when they were replicating and that made like a 10 percent difference in accuracy so you know just don't forget it and it, it, it's a good sort of a thing to keep track of when you're debugging and often uh, when people come to me with uh, during office hours and uh, they say that oh my perceptron or svm or something is just not working i, I don't know why and I look at the code and I see, oh, the bias is missing. And all you have to do is add that one extra thing and everything just works. I'm not saying it's going to fix all your bugs, but it's a bug to just be aware of. Okay, uh, I'm gonna wrap up this section as an exercise. Um, remember, I want you to try these things out because it's worth kind of uh, going over this offline. Uh, try to represent the disjunction, which is just uh, the function x1 or x2 or you have a bunch of R. So let's take a disjunction with three variables. Try to represent this as a linear classifier. Uh, this is just a nice exercise for you to kind of think about how to, how to invent linear classifiers without using a learning algorithm. And the other thing I want you to think about is how do you exp express the, uh, the uh, apply the feature expansion trip, trick to the XOR function because that is a useful uh, 
way for you to kind of figure out whether you understand the feature expansion idea. Questions? <laughs> 